Good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you're joining us from across the country. We are going to get started in just a few minutes here as we wait for our group to join us. But welcome to the 2023 Insurance Industry Trends webinar presented to you by Coterie Insurance. We're excited to have you all here today. For those that are joining us live as you come in, feel free to introduce yourself in the comments. Let us know where you're joining us from and we will begin the webinar shortly. A few things to mention as our group is beginning to join us that we will be accepting comments throughout the webinar today. So we'd love for you to enter any questions or thoughts that you have in the conversation throughout today's discussion. We want to make this as engaging as possible. So we'd love to have your questions uh, if you can enter them into the comments throughout today's presentation. Awesome to see some of those participants joining so far. It looks like we have great representation across the country. So welcome everyone, excited to have you all here and definitely excited for today's discussion. Awesome. So we are just a couple minutes past the hour. We know we're excited to get into the conversation today. So with that, I'll kick things off. My name is Ashley Bird and I'm the marketing manager here at Coterie Insurance. I love working with our agents and partners and really enabling them with content, resources and marketing tools to really help them grow their agencies. Just to share a little bit about Coterie Insurance, we're revolutionizing the small business insurance market today by, ena by enabling coverage for today's small business owners from Main Street to home-based businesses and everything in between. We leverage data and technology and digital underwriting in order to enable a transparent and accurate quoting and binding process. This really arms our agents and brokers and partners today with cutting edge technology and the tools that they need to get small businesses the coverage that they need. With the most expansive appetite across the market, Coterie is dedicated to seeing the small businesses of today succeed. So with that, I'll bring in our panelists and we'll get to start introducing them and so that we can get to know them and then we'll jump into the discussion. First up, we have Becky Monfrey, who is our Director of Digital Partnerships. Welcome, Becky. Can you introduce yourself? Yes, um, Becky Monfrey, as Ashley mentioned, I am the Director of Digital Partnerships here at Coterie. So I sit on the sales um, and marketing team and growth. Um, we really are the arm responsible for engaging with our agents, making sure their voices are heard. Um, one of my areas of passion is really um, helping agents kind of move into the digital um, experience in the digital era and I'm happy to be here um, with the team today. Awesome. Thanks, Becky. Next up, we have Brian Thomas. Brian is our Director of Claims Experience. Brian, tell us a little bit about yourself. Greetings and salutations, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Ashley, and the rest of the panelists. Uh, by role, I am the Director of Claims Experience here at Coterie Insurance. Uh, really brought on to uh, help kind of green light an internal claims management model. Uh, we were uh, using uh, TPA for the majority of our claims, but now the majority of our claims, I'm going to say two thirds, if not a little bit more, are handled internally. So just a lot of maintenance behind that. Uh, we're leveraging technology and trying to do what we can to meet the customer we are, which will be a common theme in this conversation today, but as well as doing it with a smile. I mean, there's a lot of uh, insurance technology that we can use to try to uh, use AI and stuff like that, but we want to use a hybrid model. We want to make sure that we have humans on the other side uh, to, show our, to show care and empathy for our insurance. But thank you guys very much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Brian, and thanks for mentioning that, that care and empathy is something we definitely strive to, to have in every interaction. Next, we have Justin Sutmiller. He's our VP of Innovation and Ex Expansion. Hey, Justin Sutmiller, uh, Head of Innovation and Expansion here at Coterie. Uh, by way of background, I'm kind of an insurance lifer. Uh, spent a few years at Farmers and Foremost doing small commercial and then nationwide insurance before that. Um, a little bit of everything from competitive intelligence, homeowners insurance, auto insurance, small commercial, uh, and a mix of kind of all states across the country and uh, launched the first insurance product here at Coterie and then have since kind of moved into a role 
doing similar things, launching new products, looking for new solutions and ways that we can kind of bring them to the market to help support agents, brokers, partners, everyone kind of across the board, as well as internally underwriting claims, sales, anything that we can do that might be shiny and new. We try to figure out a way to make it commercially viable. So glad to be here. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. I'm definitely excited to get into your, your forward thinking and innovation brain there. Um, and last but certainly not least is Pete Bucola, who heads our, up, up our insurance department. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, at Coterie Insurance, we are really proud about the insurance team that we have that collaborates with our technology and product and data teams and claims teams. Um, we've, uh, we have underwriting insurance product and insurance operations uh, all here in house. And we're the team that sort of is the intellectual component to um, digitizing and automating a lot of these experiences that you see in delivering those policies to your customers and, and policyholders. When I was um, in my prior company, a lot of times we spent time is in a room is how do we write larger accounts? We always asking that, how do, we, how do we write larger accounts? And no one really sits around the table and asks, well, how do we write the really small stuff? How do we write the small accounts, right? So really at, at Coterie, what we're all about is that small business. There's 32 million small businesses in America. 92% of them have fewer than 20 employees. And you think about the, the their needs and how they buy insurance, how they interact with their insurer and their partners, we're really um, spending a lot of time on trying to solve that, uh, those difficulties that they have and getting them insurance faster, um, faster, simpler, and, and with the service that they need. Awesome, Pete. Thank you. That's great. You know, love the just hearing the various experience of our panelists today. So really excited for this conversation. Um, before we jump into it, just a couple more housekeeping things. As I mentioned at the outset, feel free to enter any questions that you have throughout the chat. We'll try our best to have our panelists answer those live throughout the conversation. And then we'll also save some time at the end for questions as well. Um, and today's conversation, again, we'll, we'll definitely be forward thinking and talking about um, InsureTech trends and what lies ahead, but we'll definitely cover, um, again, any questions that come in. So really excited to jump into the conversation. And we'll kind of think of it, you know, as, as Becky mentioned, she's on the growth side of things. So she's al always looking externally at what's going on with our partners and our agents. So we'll really take a start there. We'll talk about, um, from Becky, your perspective and looking out across the landscape, and you've been in the industry for some time now. How has the how has InsureTech evolved over the last few years, and and what changes do you see happening, maybe starting this year, and even looking forward? I'm gonna start with you, Becky. Sorry, I can you repeat that? I had a lag on my side. Sure. Yep. How has InsureTech evolved over the past few years, and then even thinking for 2023 and ahead, what do you see happening or changes coming up for this year? Um. You know, from a lot of different perspectives, um, I think some of the, you know, hot words and trends are, of course, people getting better um, with their data and using that to their advantage um, really is still trending, in my opinion, in moving kind of from um, creating like awesome um, product to awesome experiences. So how do we take what um, we've built and, you know, now that we have interest, but really optimize that um, that product and try to get that out to more people. Um, you know, I think at one point in time, there were a lot of, op not a lot of options, right, in InsureTech. And now that we're seeing more options in InsureTech, especially, you know, whether it's the technology or the, the MGA space, um, the people that are rising to the top are the ones that are really invested in those experiences. Um, and the, those are some of the things that I'm really seeing the agents talk about. Um, and now more interest in agents getting on board. So at one point in time, um, too, it was, hey, um, you know, this is cool, so cool that these modern agencies are doing these things. And now one of the trends I'm seeing with agents is, um, hey, how do we do that, too? Um, so that's one of the big the big trends we're seeing for, for very um, kind of low-tech, no-tech agents that are starting to say, like, hey, I, I think this model, this model will work, you know, Yeah, absolutely. I think we, Becky, we 
may have lost you for just a second, but that's okay. We'll keep it moving. Actually, I see um, Justin's at the top of my screen now. So I'll hand it over to you, Justin. I know you, again, you mentioned some of your experience in the years in the industry. What have you seen, you know, kind of in the past and then bringing that to today? What does that, what does that roadmap look like for InsureTech specifically, but any other trends around that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the big thing right now, where InsureTech is and the, the buzzwordy stuff on LinkedIn and Twitter and everywhere else is sort of like, InsureTech 1.0 and now InsureTech 2.0. Well, what does that mean? It very much is a maturation of sort of going beyond just sort of a simple idea or a niche approach and a single piece of technology or potentially a single sliver of a piece of the market that might want something. It's a lot, it's getting a lot more mature in terms of the breadth of which some of the solutions can help. And what I think we're going to see, we're going to see a few things. Some of these will sound ominous. Consolidation, some of the players might go away. They they might not make it because the funding environment has changed. The market has changed. A lot of things are going a little bit differently than 24 months ago, 18 months ago, absolutely differently than 12 months ago. And so some might not make it, they might get acquired, they might end up merging, they might just shut down. Um, but it doesn't mean the things they created weren't great ideas and things that can help us move forward. There are going to be also be a lot of partnerships, a lot of co-opetition. There are a lot of players in the space that are thought of as new entrants, as well as legacy players that are figuring out ways to work together. Back to that point we've already touched on of, if it's about achieving the end customer's desired experience, you don't need to be the one player that does it all. You need to bring together the right players that can do it in the way they want to see it. And so if the agent or the end customer has a desired experience in mind, those that can meet that need are the ones that are going to move ahead. And if you are, say, a monoline commercial carrier and you identify a need across lines and you have someone that you can partner with well that has a similar experience, that's something we're probably going to see. Um, I think the other trend we're going to see that's already started to come to fruition, Codery's a little bit in this space and others are here, embedded. And what does embedded mean? We're getting to the point where the definitions are getting very clear and people are starting to understand what is meant by embedded and what is meant by a point of relevance. And it doesn't mean it's all the way to that end of the spectrum where it's like, oh, I buy the thing and insurance comes with it. It's more of a, here's a thing I already use. It's my accounting platform. It's my HR service platform. And now it's very simple for me to interact with insurance there. And so I think we're going to just see a lot of maturity. And that to me is what InsureTech 2.0 is. It's maturity, faster cycles, getting all the way from startup MGA to full stack, if that's the path someone's going to take those things are going to be a known path now and people are going to do them faster. Yeah, that's great. And that definitely is on par with a lot of the, the feedback that we've been hearing. And that actually segues really to you, Brian, thinking about it from you know the embedded perspective and really truly offering that value that comes with actually purchasing insurance. From your perspective, what does that look like? What does that look like? How have things been up to date on the claim side of things? And then what does that look like moving forward? Fantastic question, Ashley. Thank you. Uh, so it's it's... Very interesting when you look at how claims has kind of traveled with regards to um, insure tech, right? The term that has been kind of sweeping the nation, if you will. Uh, claims has been on a little bit of the back burner um, uh, when it comes to um, a lot of that. Why? Because it's the service side of things. It's the uglier side of things, to so to speak. Um, it is not the attractive side in terms of marketing, in terms of uh, retaining policyholders, getting new policyholders, renewals, and everything like that. Uh, but when it comes down to how we can you leverage technology and making our way better is how we communicate with our customers and how we resolve the claims. Um, come a couple within that in terms of clarity and edification of ensuring that the insured or the claimant, the non-insured, is involved in the process in some capacity, meaning they have visibility into, I see that the process is here, we have to do this before we can get here. 
um, uh, far too often in, in a legacy carrier world, uh, you'll have folks that kind of are in the dark, right? Uh, so that's where that whole point of meeting the customer where they are and kind of having that conversation and letting them know the expectations, right? Under promise, over deliver. If I say, I'm going to call you back in three days, I'll call you back in two, making sure that we are involving them in the process. So you can kind of see how that human element offers a certain ability to to um, uh, to proceed in that fashion, but also using technology and finding ways to not only reach out and communicate with them, whether it be telephone, email, text message, um, um, or through social media channels. And then for payments is, you know, not going exactly only with paper checks. Urgh, I hate paper checks. I mean, I know we have to have them, but virtual payment options is just the, the better way of doing it. Quicker, easier, and a lot safer. Yeah, 100%. I think we've seen, you know, sometimes it can be said in the insurance industry, things move years behind other industries, but I definitely think on the claim side, we're doing, seeing a lot of strides in that area. So thanks for sharing that, Brian. And then really thinking about, you know, the bread and butter and the insurance and underwriting. Pete, what are your thoughts? I mean, you've, you've seen a lot of changes in the space. What do you think, you know, the next, you know, few years holds really in the underwriting and, and insurance space? Yeah, so there's, there's two things converging at once. We have Simultaneously, we have an interest rate environment that's in the 7% range, right? So that's changing carriers, balance sheet and income asset mix and so forth. Um, it's also changing investors hurdle rates for investments in other insure tech projects and initiatives, right? So that that's out there. So that, that's demonstrable. The other converging issue on a macro level is the fact that we're entering essentially the hardest capacity market we've ever had in 40 years. So you have these two competing things that are that are going to force out a couple of things. Number one, um, if the premise is still getting closer to the customer, which we believe it is, we also believe that the that the part of the secret is pulling out friction and removing touch points so that we take a customer and we meet them throughout the journey from issue policy issuance, claim and renewal. How do we how do we automate more of those processes and do them with integrity? And ultimately, the the linchpin that we think is what we've really doubled down on is really that underwriting process. So the underwriting uh, discipline and under practice of figuring out what are we insuring, do we want to insure it, at what price and what terms and conditions. We're using uh, a coterie. We're using a tremendous amount of third party data in real time to understand what that risk is, and then convert that into something that can be monetized for our partners, for our, for our distribution partners, right? So now that that, now that that distribution partner is more focused on the terms and conditions and customizing that coverage for the consumer rather than the arduous task of trying to understand what the risk is. So over time, the whole value stream at Coterie and I think the industry is really gonna be going to, we're gonna insure tech 2.0, it's how do we really make sure we're doing the risk selection properly, the pricing properly, um, because ultimately in the day, you, you can't just be a growth engine and you can't just be a solution provider. You, at some point you have to know where you're fitting into that value stream. And uh, we're really leaning into, um, that experience for our partners. Yeah, no, that's, that's really key that you honed in on that. And Pete, I'll, I'll kind of stick with you for a second there. What role really will data and technology play in a lot of that, right? Like looking, evaluating risk and, and taking a look at that under a more microscope level. Yeah, for, for agents, certainly there's a tremendous opportunity with data enrichment and just understanding who their customer, their, their current customers are, who their prospects are, understanding that landscape from a, a, um, a quantitative and digital perspective and, and having um, that available to essentially transact um, much more quickly and understand what those needs are. So we're seeing a lot of, we're seeing a lot more data available to agents in that fashion. We're also seeing a lot more inferent data that's being pushed to uh, available to an insurance carrier that's with greater levels of coverage, greater accuracy, uh, and new sources of data. So we've up, up historically typically had you know scoring and and social media scores and building condition. We've never really had cell phone traffic in the past. We've never had um, other sort of uh, publicly available information that would help an underwriter stand a risk. So we're just seeing an acceleration of that. I'd say really in the last even year um, since we've been in this in this space, uh, just the the quality and availability of third party data to help with some of that decision making 
Um, it can be really useful for uh, carriers pre-bind, which is our case. Um, and some carriers are, are looking at that from a post-bind perspective as well. Yeah, awesome. And that's really what's key, I think, and even thinking through, again, Justin, some of the, the things that you brought out earlier. So same similar question to you, Justin, would be like, for a date, from a data and technology perspective, what are you what are you thinking that the market is going to use to to drive innovation? What it, what what changes are we going to see? What does that look like? Um, I mean, I the actual data that will be used, I'm eager to find out. I I I've seen samples of a lot of it. I will tell you some of it is scary. There are items that people will offer you that I have actually looked at them and said, yeah, we're interested, but can you not send these fields? Because A, we don't want to capture them. We don't want to store them. We don't even want to have access to them because we should not have any part of that. And I get it. You modeled it. And there might be a marketing purpose that will be well served in social media land. Because if you're trying to, I, I'll give a bad, if you're trying to sell something that is somewhat has religious connotations, then it might be a value to target the right market. We don't want or need anything to do with that when we are trying to determine the level of risk at a particular location or with an individual or a business. There are databases out there that have all of that. So figuring out through all of the noise, which ones are the signal, that's actually the hard part. And that's what's going to be a lot of it is now we've created this new world with, and I don't even know the current terms of whatever the, the thing way bigger than gigabytes and megabytes and whatever. We have an infinite amount at this point. We need to now figure out how to make it actionable. And we need to then figure out how to set rules against it, automate, systematize, do all of those things, but then end up with a reasonable outcome. Even if you become the best a modeler of risk and you have the most predictive model, if it's not explainable, it doesn't actually make it the best model in the market. And if it is such a black box that you get not intuitive answers that even the most informed person on Pete's team cannot explain, it's not going to work well. It's not going to feel good to an agent. It's not going to make sense to a customer and it's probably just not going to sell. So some happy median in there of a large amount of data being modeled with human assistance to understand what it's doing and then actually apply to the completion of an application. That is some of the things we've seen and talked about are we want to speed it up for agents. That doesn't always mean that we have better data. We just have a starting point perhaps that we want to get feedback or validation on, or if you don't know at all, it might bring something to your attention. We don't go in with the assumption that an agent is trying to mislead us or trying to misrepresent a risk. By and large, they're all saying, I want to get the right coverage for this business owner, and I want to apply the right coverage and get it with a carrier I can trust. We want to be there and do that, and we trust them. We start with a sort of trust first relationship. And then we want to help and speed that up. So that's what this next phase is going to be. It's going to be really taking these large amounts, this vast amount of data, bringing it down to something actionable. Yes, using it for pricing and modeling and things like that, but using it in a kind of meaningful way that is explainable and applicable. You need to stay in line with DOIs doing their the right work, the work they need to be doing, keeping people in line. You need to have that in mind and price and underwrite that way, but you also need to inform the agent and the customer why things are what they are. Yeah, 100%. And just like you said, leveraging that to enable the agents to really just do their their roles way more efficiently. And I think, Becky, you have a great perspective on that too. What are you seeing um, in terms of the use of data when it comes to our agents, our partners? What does that look like? Yeah. So one of the things that I see agents really kind of coming forward with too is like, agents with large books of small commercial or small person lines or everything like they have a ton of data right they have not only the data but they have the you know agency management system interactions and how they're using that data what the policyholders are changing what they're using um one of the trends that i'm starting to see too is people being more interested in like 
hey, your data is great too, but how do I mine the data that I already have? How do I interact with that? And again, to Justin's point, like have actionable items, like who should I be spending my time with? Which ones, of, which one of my renewals is more likely to not renew or to renew? Um, you know, are my customer customers happy with me? What what are the touch points I need to do within my agency um, based on that data to make sure that they stay? So, um, hey, claims with you know, as an example, like every time Coterie has a claim, my satisfaction score goes up. Like that would be something great that agents want to interact with. Um, they want to know, you know, who who um, you know. Who are the great touch points? If if there is a claim, you know, is that the greatest time to um, reach out and say, "Hey, do you want to buy an umbrella?" Maybe not, right? So using that behavioral data within the um, within their agency management system is something I'm seeing more and more agents um, being interested in solving for. Yeah, that's that's great. It's a great perspective to really understand that. And I mean, going into you know your role, really, Brian. I mean, I think it's very similar, right? Like kind of looking at that that prediction data. Is there anything specifically on the data side that you know claims in, in your team that you're looking at? Fantastic question. So a lot of what we do in claims comes down to what we're going to have for reserving, right? Reserving and kind of making sure that we have enough money set aside to specifically pay these claims, but also keep our loss ra loss ratio to a certain amount. Um, because obviously we, want, we don't wanna have $5 in our pocket and pay out 10. Business is gonna close, simple as that. So we wanna make sure that we are appropriately reserving and then appropriately resolving these claims. But then also having that communication with the underwriting team on Pete's side. Um, I'm gonna give you my example, and not a lot of people understand this example, but you will. Okay, so claims is like the security inside the nightclub, Underwriting is like the security outside the nightclub, right? Underwriting is going to make sure you're properly dressed to be inside and make sure everything is good. And then once you get inside, we have to make sure that you act accordingly, right? So there's going to be a lot of, it's a two-way partnership, right? Underwriting is going to be able to have a lot of conversations with claims and kind of let us know in terms of what type of uh, products we're offering out. These are type of enhancements or endorsements we might have. And then we can circle back and say, you know what, this may not exactly work. We may have to tweak or adjust this. But also we can see, OK, we're having a lot of losses specifically in this venue. So this might be something that we need to now add some additional pricing on. So data is something so integral in the world of claims. And obviously, as we converse with the rest of the organization. Awesome. I'll, I'll ask you, I think that, that is a unique a differentiator, I think, for Coterie specifically. I'm a little self-serving here. But having our a claim team in-house like that, it, it just affords us closer collaboration uh, and a feedback loop that um, really just, at the end of the day, it just it helps improve the product and experience. Um, where we're able to align the intent of what we were trying to do with the consumer, with a with a claimant, and uh, so I, we're really we're really proud of the fact that we have our claim team in house to to respond to, to claimants and uh, give them a coterie experience that is differentiated. And, and Pete's team will explain why no one with hats can get into the nightclub. That's they need <laughs> to explain that part. <laughs> For sure, and yeah, we that's great, great analogy there, Brian. Because I think we can definitely, we can definitely understand that was so. Love hearing each of your perspectives because I think it just, it just highlights the importance of data, right? And how there's just so many different applications throughout the the, the insurance transaction. So, um, kind of switching gears just a little bit, and, and I think we touched on this a little bit too. Um, and I'll start with you, Becky. You know, how how are we as Coterie and even in the industry itself? evolving to really enable agents to sell and service um, their customers more profitably? Well, um, I would say, first of all, one of Coterie's like main missions has always been, let's be where people want to buy insurance. So let's work with independent agents um, who are experts. Let's um, enable independent agents by um, allowing for quick and simplistic quoting opportunities, really driving efficiency in the agency. Um, let's be honest, small commercial sometimes is not the most um, efficient process. Um, and oftentimes policies are even smaller than a personal lines policy. So trying to get that, um, you know, but there's so many small businesses. I think, um, Pete, did you quote 32 million um, small businesses in the United States? So there's a huge opportunity to try to enable our agents to do that. Um, Coterie is live um, with most like commercial rating platforms. Um, so we're integrated there. So, um, you know, if you want to use a rater or even your agency management system to quote 
um, and even bind insurance were there. Um, so that's one of the main focuses that we've um, really spent a lot of time and energy on. And then, um, as Justin mentioned earlier, that embedded option. So if policyholders um, want a simplistic, you know, quote issue bind um, experience, whether that's on an agent's website um, or in other venues, um, we're there too. So we really try to make ourselves available for people who want um, a fast and easy way to buy insurance. Yeah, we've, we've definitely seen that in feedback that, you know, that that speed and efficiency in, in doing business has been truly invaluable for our agents, both, you know, our agents and our partners as we've been working with them and expanding those relationships. Pete, is there anything that you would add in terms of enabling, you know, that, that more profitable um, experience for agents? Yeah, I mean, th the goal we have internally is we want the agents to come to Coterie first when they're when they're trying to build and grow this segment in their in their agency. That's really what we made we made the simply buying experience geared toward is really that new business acquisition organic growth. And so this is just the very first version of that experience. We're working on some ways that we can continue to enhance that experience and make it even more valuable to agents. And um, we're, we're excited about what's going to be coming in, in you know, this year, but really it's about how do we give that agent the very first opportunity to respond to that phone call, respond to that prospect, the salon owner, the local contractor, the local business in their territory, respond back with not a bunch of questions, but actually a bindable price. That's really, that's really the value we're trying to bring on that side. And then we're, we're fulfilling that promise with very, with essentially instantaneous policy issuance, COI, service with in-house and in-house team and a claim that's in-house. So we're really trying to take on and look at the entire value stream and make that acquisition experience for agent easier, make the agents' lives easier to grow their agencies. Awesome. Thanks, Pete. Um, definitely love hearing that perspective as well. Um, and then really, you know, kind of thinking, you know, again, future looking that that's the whole topic and, and thought behind this webinar. So I'd love to get into some some bold predictions. So I'll start with with our 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 featured forward thinkers, Justin, any bold predictions for the future of whether it's embedded insurance, small commercial and hear your thoughts. Oh, I so my bold predictions are going to be a little too crazy. Now you see, you sort of, I, I knew it was coming and I'm yeah. still uh, kind of on the fence. As We to, won't hold you to it. We won't quote you to it. No, but, I, no. So, I, I mean, in terms of bold predictions, I, I would say th things we will see. I think there will be a continuation that there will be a, like, and I, this absolutely, I, I will just come out and say, this is not coming from me having any insider knowledge, knowing anything at all about any company, my own the, coterie. I don't know anything about the, and or others. The, I believe there will be a large big ticket partnership merger where large players that people view as, okay, th those two companies have raised large amounts of money. I believe there will be consolidation and there will be some that make people say, stop and take pause and say, oh, okay, like now, oh, we're doing this. Like some of the things that, and you're seeing them across kind of fintech and other spaces, insurtech is a little bit of behind broader like banking and fintech. I think there will be some consolidation and, and some big games. I also believe tech players who will try again in insurance, not necessarily the way Google was, you know, kind of, trying to do insurance and everyone said, oh man, Google's here or Amazon's here in the UK doing insurance. I think there will be some round two of tech companies trying again, now that they have a little more knowledge of the insurance space. I think, you know, that there's an easy explanation to me of the Google came in and said, I can make a comparison platform. And then they said, oh wait, but if the gajillions of dollars insurance companies are paying me in Google ad money starts to dry up at all. If that even goes down like this much, me being in the insurance distribution game makes zero sense. So of course they probably pulled back out. Certain players don't have that same kind of space. So I think there will be a name, a big tech name or two that get back into the space in a meaningful way. Um, and I think there will be some big ticket consolidation um, I also think on the not so positive side, I think there will be some big ticket down that some big names that really 
fall off the cliff, maybe even cease to exist because it it's not an easy game. There are a lot of things that have to go the right way and have to be in place. And we've seen the loss ratios and combined ratios of some of the, the early entrants and they just aren't sustainable. And if the reinsurance market's not there for you, where are you going to go with that risk? You can't keep writing the new ones. And it, it is very hard to avoid a death spiral when you start carving up your appetite. You're trying to raise rates over here and trying to protect some portion of the book over there. It's, it's absolutely a balancing act. And I think we will see to kind of sum it up one big tech player, probably one big downfall and probably one big consolidation of, of, players so there's my my bold prediction all right. <laughs> we'll take it it's not all doom and gloom i appreciate that part justin thank you um next brian what anything from you any any bold predictions on your side well easy now i, I don't want to go too bold uh, <laughs> but uh but i, I just want to kind of jump a little bit on uh, uh adding on to what justin was saying and i'm going to use the term that he said not gajillion i'm going to save that one for a later day but he did use a term earlier co-op Coopetition, I think. I think that's what you said, and I deciphered in my mind, and I completely understand that because I myself in my career have seen those coopetitions happen. Um, I was with insurance when insurance was purchased by Allstate, right? So Allstate know they wanted a certain um, type of niche market, but no, they couldn't knew they couldn't do it, right? So they had to absorb a company that did it. Um, a similar similar scenario. I was with Travelers when they had a minor partnership with Geico because there was certain areas where Geico wanted to get out of the exclusive auto market and get into homes and other package deals, but they didn't know how to walk. But travelers knew how to, and that's what helped them out there. So there's going to be a lot of those big partnerships that are going to happen because there are these giant players that are out in the market that really want to touch on the leveraging technology of things, but they just don't have people or they don't have the resources to do so. So that marrying of the two heads will just kind of make a huge conglomerate of this huge beast, insurance beast um, that uh, that Justin was talking about. But yeah, no, that, that's definitely going to be uh, down the line. With regards to um, diversification, that's another thing. You, you have to be mindful in how many products you look to touch, right? You don't want to have 80% of everything, but there has to be one or two things that you want to do great. You know, 100%, one or two things that you know what you're doing, you're a difference maker. Um, to, to, to Pete's point, you want to be the first name that comes to mind when you're looking in that specific category. So you have to be mindful in terms of your diversification as well. But um, yeah, no, I, I agree on all points. This is going to be a, a quite exciting, a quite exciting uh, next five years. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that as well. And Becky, I mean, I think, you know, you're you're in partnership facing and focused on our partnerships. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to don't reveal any trade secrets there, but anything that you're thinking in terms of bold predictions? Well, first, I'm just going to circle back to the coopetition. Um, I like to call it frenemy status. So that's that's the terminology I use is like we're, you know, competing side by side, but also have similar interests and can gain something to learn. So um, we see that um, quite a bit in this space. Um, one of the things that my kind of bold prediction maybe kind of even goes against um, what even Brian and Justin said, but I predict that um, there's going to be some hesitation for businesses to move away from core um, business. With the state of the economy, I just feel like there's it's either going to be like go big or go home in some of this um, space. So the people that are maybe just are have dabbled in the past um, by just putting their toes in are going to pull back a little bit and say, yeah, we're just going to stick to core operations or, you know, that's not for us right now. Um, and that might be because of resource constraints or other um, other things. Um, but then I think there are going to be some bigger people that are like, nope, we're all in and going to take advantage of that um, hesitation of some of the other markets and spaces. So um, that's what I'm seeing. And then also, I think um, from a partnership and agency standpoint, agents, I think, are just they're just getting more. Um, they're getting better at digital. Um, and so I just see that space um, taking off, whether it's in-house, um, you know, trying to get better at just, um, being more efficient and optimizing their operations, but getting better at bringing in technology in-house and actually making it part of their day-to-day, -day, um, versus again, something they're just dabbling in. Yeah. 
That, that totally makes sense there. And our audience agrees definitely with that, with that sentiment. And I think it's consistent with what we're seeing. Um, still open for questions. If anyone in our audience has any questions, we'd love to hear those. Um, I think there is one that we're going to answer here in the chat just shortly, because I think it is a little bit more specific, but keep those questions and, and feedback coming throughout the discussion. Um, we're getting closer to wrapping things up. So I want to kind of pivot just a little bit. And I mean, again, we've heard tons of really, you know, unique and interesting perspectives from um, our panelists this afternoon. So one to just kind of see, get to know you and what your role is and everything is, you know, fun question. So I'll start with you, Pete. So you're sitting around the dinner table, you know, friends, family, extended family, and you, they ask, you know, what do you do for work? What do you do every day, Pete? How do you describe what you do for work every day? It's uh, it's, <laughs> it's hard to, to make insurance fun, but um, one of the things I like to do is just take everyday ordinary like businesses that we all interact with every day and, and talk about, um, you know, the worst case scenarios. And um, in the, could you imagine if you walked into a Burger King and there was a tiger there and someone got mauled by a tiger? Yeah. Well, that's, that's a Cody. What we do is we help people get back from, <laughs> get back from, to, to where they were before, before the tiger mauling. So that's with the little kids, you know, the second grader, but, um, I think talking about, you know, just really the, the ability to get people back to where they were, because um, we all we hear a lot of negative news in, the, in, in our lives, but being able to talk about insurance as a mechanism for good, uh, as a mechanism for good, I think everyone likes to hear that. And I think that's really what we're, we're about is, is um, making businesses whole and keeping them going in America. Yeah, no, that's awesome, Pete. And I 100 percent agree. I'm also a small business owner. So really thinking about, you know, the the entire insurance experience is, is really a benefit and a value for businesses, I think is is huge. So same question to you, Justin. If you're, you know, I know you have kids, if you're explaining to your kids, like what does dad do for work? Like what do you how do you explain that? Well, I so I'll start with a giant letdown because I as I was dropping my three-year-old off at daycare, one of her teachers came up and said, so we have to ask, what do you do for work? Because Kendall said, you do magic. And so it is not magic. And I had to explain to her, I do not do, I, I could like, you know, make a strawberry at breakfast disappear by like doing one of these. And so she apparently thinks I can do magic and has now told all of her friends I do magic, but uh, I do not do magic. I, I sort of summarize it mostly as it is it is commercial insurance for small businesses like shoe stores and restaurants that we all go to but the main thing that we are trying to do is we are trying to move insurance to the place where i believe the the current state of the customer expectation speed is judged by the buy it now button they want to buy it now like they do on ebay like they do on amazon like they do anywhere else with everything they want to order a pizza in three clicks from Domino's and have it show up right here. They want to order new shoes and have it show up before they even go to sleep tonight. Well, they want to be able to get a quote for insurance and buy it today, not wait till next week or not wait till someone calls them back or or they enter their information on a site and then like seven agents all call them and bombard them. We know that that experience is not one that customers love either. And I don't love it myself when I... I'm out trying to do my own competitive intel, looking around. I'm like, I don't really want to enter an email address into this field because I know what's going to happen. So that my dinner table version is making the buy it now button version of commercial insurance is sort of my my short answer. I'll cut myself off. No, I love that. We need to like commercialize it, like put that on a T-shirt or something, the buy it now button for insurance. I love it. All right, Brian, you, you're up next. You've got a, an infant too. Like, what are you, how are you explaining it to the... <laughs> To the little ones, like what did what did dad do for for work? Gosh, she's turning nine months in a couple of days. She doesn't understand anything outside of Google and Gaga, right? So, <laughs> but if I had to translate the Googles and Gagas, it would be, um, I mean, claims is the thing. It's very interesting because claims is like, it's like being an EMT, but I don't have to touch anybody. Right. So I'm there in an emergency standpoint. I'm there to assist people when something has happened in their life that is unscheduled. Right. So we have to be there in their time of need. They they have an insurance policy. They purchase an insurance policy with their hard earned premiums. And it's just a bunch of papers. But those papers don't really mean anything until the claim comes. And that is our guarantee that we are going to be there in their time of need. 
Um, and um, the small business world is something that is so close to me. I mean, Ash, just like yourself, you said you're a small business owner. I am the product of a small business owner. My father owned a small business for the better part of 45 years. And I saw that man struggle for many, many years. So when I uh, um, was offered the opportunity to work with a company that gives back to that community, I mean, you know, it, it, it's a drop in the hat. And I know most of our agents on this call and the ones who weren't able to join us feel the same way. Uh, this is an unrepresented population in the world. Mm -hmm. And if you believe it or not, <laughs> this country was built on small business owners. Uh, when a plumber comes to here, it's not, the plumber is not from Apple. <laughs> the plumber is just a, a dude and a hammer. Um, so that, that's, that's what it comes down to in us being able to assist that population and having that coverage and setting that aside out of their mind so they can focus their attention on their craft at hand is just uh, spot on. But um, Google Gaga, there you go. Yeah, all right. I love it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Brian. And Becky, similar for you. I mean, I know you're, you're talking to our partners and, and everything, but what do you... You can you know answer the same question like how would you explain what you do for work but then also to our partners right like how do you explain the coterie difference i'd love to hear your your perspective on that so um my kids first of all have been hearing me talk about insurance for 14 plus years to them and i've been in the industry for almost um 18 years but um I've like just relinquished the fact that I don't try to explain it anymore. Um, I once was told by my daughter, um, can you just tell people you work at McDonald's or something? Because it just gets too confusing. Um, and actually one of our co-founders gave me the advice of just tell everyone you work at a tech startup because that sounds way more like interesting um, and fun uh, sometimes than just talking about insurance, even though I, I'm super passionate about it. Um, so your other question was, what do I tell partners kind of what the coterie difference is? Um, so I would say that first of all, like we are great people to work with, um, people first organization. Um, so if we don't have the answer for you, we're certainly working on finding that out. Um, we're also great at taking your feedback and your information. Um, we're building a company, so you're not working with a 100 plus year old legacy company that is um, already stuck in their ways, right? We're taking that feedback, we're building for you. Um, so that's one of the main differences um, that I see um, working at Coterie. But then also just, you know, we're really here to grow your business. Like that is our focus. We want you to be able to grow quickly, um, that's the only way that we're going to grow quickly as well. Um, so we're really trying to give that value add to our, our agents and to our customers um, and ensuring them with a great product. Yeah. Awesome, Becky. And I think that's really what goes a long way. And, and especially in the relationship side of things that just to hearing all of you and, and talk about the experience and the relationships that we've built, you know, across the industry and being able to really leverage that expertise to, to serve both our agents and partners and ultimately the small businesses across the country. So really appreciate each of you for being here. I loved like just learning from you and, and hearing your experiences and really how you're thinking about the future of InsureTech. I think that's something that we're all really excited about. I mean, again, someone said before, like insurance might not be the most exciting industry, but I personally think it is as being like probably one of the newbies to the to the insurance space. So it's just awesome to hear, you know, their bold predictions and also all of the ways that we're leveraging data and technology in our in our individual roles. So with that, we'll wrap up today's webinar. Again, I really want to thank all of our audience for joining us from really all over the country. As we can see in the comments, it's very exciting. This was our first webinar of 2023. Um, the only other thing that we'll mention is just how you can reach us and get in contact with us. So um, obviously you can visit CoterieInsurance.com. You can also follow all of our panelists here on LinkedIn. They're all great and engaging um, on, on LinkedIn as well as myself personally. And if you're new to Coterie, you're not familiar with how to work with us or partner with us, head over to CoterInsurance.com again. You can either become a producer or a partner. Um, and then if you are already working with Coterie and you have questions about maybe some of the topics that you heard today or, or how to fully leverage technology in your own agency, definitely reach out to your distribution partner. Um, but again, visit our website and we'd love to, to hear from you soon in the future. Take care, everyone, and have a great day.